scared that my heart is getting hard To see if myself from hurting I locked it in the dark And as it rests inside my chest It's dried out and hardened Now all feeling it deflects chapter 9. The text has been read for us. And we go back to the beginning and start in verse 14, where the Apostle Paul writes and says, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? The text begins this morning with an accusation against God, nonetheless. Hmm. It's a bit of a hypothetical accusation, but it's an accusation that Paul anticipates being made against the things that he's written in the first 13 verses of this chapter. It's an accusation against God that springs out of the way that God dealt with a certain pair of twins in human history. (laughs) We read about it, and some of us are put off by it. In verses 11, 12, and 13 of this chapter, it reveals to us how before the twins were even born, Esau and Jacob by name, before either of those boys had done anything good or anything evil, God had already made up His mind about their destiny. The word is predetermined. Oh, is that a controversial one in the Christian circle? You want to stir up any discussion among believers, throw that word out there. God had predetermined certain aspects of their life and destiny, which involved, among other things, the blessing of one over the other. Those verses that we have went through already detailed for us or at least alluded to the fact that over the subsequent 1,500 years of Jewish history after their departure from this world is enough to give ultimate proof to anybody who's paying attention that God's decisions are absolute. His desires and His decisions based upon the lives of these two boys was ultimately fulfilled by the way that they lived and the ancestry or the descendants that each of them produced. And that bothers people. People take issue with this. And I'll say it's Christians who take issue with it. Because it's Christians who are aware of the verse that says, uh, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Unbelievers out there don't They don't know this verse. They might know a few verses, but I'm guessing this is one of them that escapes their attention. This verse escapes a lot of Christian attention. And so when we find it, we're like, wait, what? We're the ones who know what the Bible says. We're the ones who read scriptures. And so it's only those who have ever read verse 13 that would ever question it, and it's Christians who do. How could God 
love somebody and hate somebody else? And how could God decide what was going to happen to them before they were even born? And how is that fair? There's a lot of people in the church who find fault in God for exercising His authority the way that He did or the way that He does. There's a lot of people who are offended when it even suggests that God might be showing favoritism, which here it appears He did. The case here before us between Jacob and Esau makes it to seem that God indiscriminately blesses some people and then damns others at will. For some reason that is beyond our understanding, God just does what He does and we have to put up with it. We take issue with that, which doesn't say as much about God as it does about us, does it? That we would take issue with the way God works at all says nothing about God. He is who He is. What are you going to do about it? But it certainly says something about us. Why are we so quick to accuse God and defend man? Raise our fists at the heavens and go, you can't do that. No matter what he does, he can. We read about God's decision here to love Jacob and hate Esau as if God committed a sin. Rather than asking how God could love either of them, knowing that they were both sinners. So God isn't the one with questionable character here, making sinful choices. Human beings are. We've got the questionable character. We're the ones that make sinful choices. I am, you are, the human race. Now, you personally might not really take issue with the way that God dealt with Esau, right? But have you ever disagreed with God on how he treated you? Yes. I'm guessing you have. Your pastor certainly has. I don't get offended when I read verse 13. I get offended when I look at what God's doing right now. I mean, this, this, I'm so far removed from Jacob and Esau. I don't even know if we're related. Probably not. I don't think so. Uh, but I'll tell you something. What he's been doing in my life this last week, this last month, this last year, I'm not too happy about that. How about you? Have you ever felt like someone else got a better go than you got? Like God preferred them over you? Do you ever feel like Esau might have felt? Or like God decided before you were even born that you'd have the disadvantage in life? You ever felt like that? You ever felt like you didn't get a fair shake? Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever looked at the discrepancies between your life and someone else's life, even within the family of God, and resented God for it? Uh, a lot of people have. A lot of people have. So if that's the case, then maybe this morning, instead of wondering how and why God hated Esau, we should marvel at the fact that he was able to love Jacob. We don't need to read God's dealings and go, hey, how could he do that? Sometimes we should read about the way God handles people and go, how could he not? How could he not? So, is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses in verse 15, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will show compassion on whomever I will have compassion. See, again, God just says, I'm going to do what I want to do uh, without question. Okay? So God provides mercy. We're, we're told here, anyway, that God provides mercy and compassion um, based on the goodness of his own nature. Based on the goodness of his own nature, not the desires of the recipients of that mercy or compassion. Not based upon the performance of the recipients of that mercy and compassion. Look at what he says in verse 16. He says, so it's not of him who wills, nor of him who runs. Okay? God doesn't give mercy and compassion because we want it or because we behave well. He does it because he wants to show mercy. God is merciful to people. Why? Just because he wants to be. God is compassionate with people. Why? Just because he wants to be compassionate. Not because we demand it. Not because we work for it. Certainly not because we deserve it. If you know anything about mercy, by definition, 
to receive mercy means you don't deserve it. Mercy means not getting actually what you do deserve. It's getting the opposite of what you actually deserve. So if we think we deserve mercy, then we're off in our definition. And God gives mercy and compassion and goodness and kindness and all of those things that really constitute who God is in his very character. He does that just because he wants to. And Psalm verse 135, verse 6 says, The Lord does whatever he pleases in heaven and on earth. He just does what he wants. And again, that can bother us because it seems selfish. There's a lot of people would say, well, if God you know, does what you know, like the Bible explains, well, isn't that selfish? Like he demands worship. That's just, that doesn't seem right. It does if you're God. The reason, the reason it's so wrong for us to be selfish is because we're not God. God gets to be selfish. God gets to, listen, God gets to be self-centered. Because everything should revolve around God. Everything is meant for God. All things were created to him and for him and by him. He did it all for himself. We're just lucky, if I may borrow a term that probably shouldn't be used from the pulpit, but if we're lucky, we're just lucky that he isn't others-centered, that he didn't put, like, we're lucky that Jesus didn't put his friends first. Jesus kept God first in all things. God was first. God was first, even above and beyond his own preferences, his own desires. Jesus actually prayed on the night of his execution to not be executed. If there's any other way, Lord. But he acquiesced to God's will and said, I, in the end, I'll do what you want. I'll put you first. I'm not first. You are. My friends aren't first. You are. The Lord does what he wants because he can. Some people in this life get five talents, if you know the parable. Some people get two talents. Some people only get one. God distributes to each as he wills. Some workers are hired at 6 a.m. Some are hired at 9 a.m. Some aren't hired until 5 in the afternoon. God does what he wants. It doesn't explain why. He just does it. Why is it like that? I don't know. Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. I'm sure of that. There is no unrighteousness with God. So if he hired you at six, doesn't matter. If he hired somebody else at five, if he gives somebody else five talents, but you only get one or two, that's God's prerogative. And so the reason we're bothered when we see these discrepancies between Jacob and Esau or me and somebody else in this life, the reason we're so bothered isn't because there's evil in God. It's because there's evil in us. And back to that parable of the workers in the vineyard, the one where some were hired at six and some were hired at nine and some... It says that when those hired early in the day came to get their pay at the end of the day, they assumed they would receive more because they worked more hours. But they too were paid a day's wage, just like those who worked for a mere hour or two. And when they received their pay, they protested to the owner, who in this parable is God, represents God, saying, those people only worked one hour, yet you've paid them just as much as you paid us who worked all day in the scorching heat. And, and what does the owner say? We agreed to this. And my money and my vineyard are to do with whatever I please. Is your eye evil because mine is good? Are you upset at me because I was so good to the people who had worked so much less in my vineyard than you did? See, the problem isn't God and the way he does things. The problem is us and the way we see them. Their attention in that parable was on what God withheld from them rather than what God had provided for them. And instead of being thankful to God, they were bitter. We're just distorted in our perception. We don't see things clearly until we notice God being 
compassionate with other people, then suddenly we're bothered by it. Again, a lot of the tension that we feel in Romans chapter 9 and has been felt for centuries now in the Christian community really comes from our refusing to believe that we're the culprit here, that we're evil, and because of it, we have a problem with God, how, with how God, with how God does stuff. Uh, if, if we weren't evil, God would never bother us. The proof of your sinful nature is made manifest when you're, when you're upset with God because of something he allowed in your life. And by the way, being upset about anything in life is an indictment against God because he allowed it. So if you woke up this morning going, oh, ice and snow, i got to scrape the windshield. Uh, <laughs> you don't like the weather that God created for you today. Okay? It's just a small little example of how easily we can be upset with what God brings to the table. Why are we so shocked to learn in our text this morning that God hardens hearts? Right? Whom he wills, he hardens. Hey, that's not fair. Really, it's not fair? Why are we so shocked to learn that God hardens hearts when the Bible says our hearts are already hard? <laughs> that's not shocking. A heart is naturally hard against God, naturally sinful. The reason we don't want to believe that isn't because God's to blame. It's because we don't really believe what the Bible says in passages like, say, Jeremiah 17, 9, that says the heart of man is desperately wicked, desperately wicked, sick beyond measure. We know the verse says that, but we don't really believe what we believe, do we? So that when God comes along and says, yeah, I harden hearts, we're like, hey, you can't do that. They were already hard. Why are we so shocked to learn that God, quote, prepares some for destruction, like it says in our text this morning? Aren't we all already headed for destruction without Christ? Didn't Jesus tell us in Matthew 7, 13, that the gate to destruction is wide and the path is broad and that's where most people are? Why are we so shocked to learn that God appoints some to wrath? Weren't we all objects of wrath without faith in Christ? The Bible says clearly that we are all objects of wrath apart from his saving grace, which is administered to men and women only through personal faith in Christ, which will produce evidence in a person's life such that without that evidence, it's extremely questionable whether you have saving faith in Jesus. And you can be as religious as you want, but without saving faith, you are still an object of wrath, even if you might not believe it. That's perhaps why we're so shocked to read passages like this that remind us that God will be wrathful and will destroy and will harden people's hearts. So the question this morning isn't, well, why did I only get two talents, but so-and-so got five talents? Or why did God wait so long to hire me? Mm -mm -mm. The real question this morning is, why did God hire me at all? Why did God give me anything at all? So instead of accusing God this morning for his alleged cruelty or favoritism one over the other, why don't we thank him over the reality of his goodness. See, we can look at the situation with Jacob and Esau, and we can either go, well, what, how could he hate Esau? What kind of a God is that that would hate anything or anybody? Let's instead look at verse 13 and go, praise the Lord that he loves anybody. Praise the Lord that he found favor with Jacob. Jacob was a terrible guy, by the way. Like, if you ever read the Old Testament account, I think his name means deceptive. Just a liar. And he was born in a family of liars. These guys quite a reputation, okay, that family. So, so today, this morning, you get to choose what your perspective on God is going to be. 
You can either, looking at God as if, oh, He's cheating me and I don't deserve it, or He's blessing me and I don't deserve it. Two choices, and it's your choice. The same gospel, the same truth can really produce two different results. 2 Corinthians 2.16 says that to one it's like sweet aroma. The truth is like perfume. And to another, that same truth is the stench of death. It irritates them, it repulses them, and they want to distance themselves from it because it stinks to them. So you can either view God and the way He involves Himself in your life through the lens of God's always after me, He's always making things hard for me, He's just jerking me around all the time, or you can look at God through the lens of mercy and compassion. God didn't have to choose me at all, but He did anyway. God didn't have to love me, but He somehow does. God doesn't have to be good to anyone, but He chooses to be good to everyone. Psalm 145 reminds us of that. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all that He has made. All that He has made. You can choose to see God through that lens, and I I believe that's the lens that the Apostle Paul prefers you and I to see God through. That's why in verse 15 he says, the Lord will have mercy and compassion on whoever he wants. He's gracious, he's wonderful, and he doles that out indiscriminately. You have been the recipient of God's mercy. That means you didn't deserve it. He did it anyway, and mercy is wonderful. I'll take some more, thank you. God indiscriminately lavishes compassion upon people who don't deserve compassion. And you have all, as well as myself, received God's compassion. He loves you. He loves you. You deserve to be loved? I mean, really, let's take a good look at this, okay? On the outside, you're a pretty good person. But the stuff that we think sometimes and the things we would do if it wasn't against the law, if we could just, come on. We all know the answer to that. And if you don't, boy, are you in the dark. One of the ways that people exercise their free will, and I know that we're all champions of free will in this country because we're all independent and we're all go-getters and we all like, you know, (laughs) right? (laughs) One of the ways that people exercise their free will is simply by deciding what, what they do with God. And get this. One of the ways that God exercises his free will is by deciding what he is going to do with people. He gave you free will and he lets you decide what you're going to do with him and he maintains his own free will and he, in the end, is going to decide what he does with you. And what he ultimately ends up doing to you is going to be based primarily upon what you do with him. Free will. You get to decide what you think of God. Isn't that wonderful that he's given us permission to decide for ourselves what we think of him? He's given us a lot of help in Scripture. But God has a free will too. I think sometimes in our self-righteous American spirit, we forget that there is somebody above us that has a free will as well. And that is Jehovah God. Shouldn't surprise us either. We were made in his image. If we have a free will, it's because he first had one. He allows you and I to assert our free will every time we make a decision that conflicts with his desires and commands. If you've ever wanted or chosen to do something that you knew he didn't agree with, That was him allowing you to exercise your free will in spite of the consequences that he warns of. He'll let you do it. That's what I'm saying. Bottom line is he'll let you sin. He'll let you keep going in that sin. He'll let you. Because that's his allowing you and I to exercise the free will that proves we're like him. So should we fault him for that? 
Furthermore, should we indict him when he makes a decision that conflict with our desires? If he lets us do things and, and decide things that he doesn't like, is he allowed to do things and say things that we don't like? I'll tell you that God didn't lose any of his power or authority to do what he pleases when he gave you and I the power and authority to do as we please. God didn't lose any power or authority when he gave us free will. He still got it. And his free will can interfere with ours anytime he pleases. In fact, his free will is as different from my free will as his creative abilities are from my creative abilities. And there's quite a distance between what God is able to create and what I'm able to create. God can create planets. I can create a sandwich. Okay? So too, his will is far above and beyond my own free will. Okay? And really, no one perhaps in all of human history or biblical history is really a better illustration of that than Pharaoh. The Pharaoh of old, the Pharaoh that we read about in the book of Exodus. The Scripture says, To the Pharaoh, in verse 17, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. This is God speaking directly to Pharaoh through his mouthpiece, who happened to be Moses. But these are God's words to Pharaoh. Therefore, verse 18, God has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills, he hardens. So here is an illustration or an example, real-life illustration from biblical history, how at one time God exercised his free will to raise someone up, Pharaoh by name, put him in a position of power, and then harden his heart. But I tell you, Pharaoh's heart was already hard. Okay? Scripture reveals to us that he had hardened it himself nearly as many times as God hardened it for him. And so what God did in that scenario was he showed his power so that his name would be declared in all the earth. And by the way, it worked. <laughs> Here we are in 2021, other side of the ocean, talking about how God did whatever he wanted to Pharaoh. So God got the job done. God will always get the job done. You cannot stand in his way. You will cooperate with God either by hardening yourself against him. He'll put you to good use. You won't benefit from it, but he'll get glory. He will put you to good use, right? You... You ever seen that? There's a bumper sticker, love wins, God wins, God wins. God wins even if you lose. He gets his pound of flesh. He will somehow receive glory even if and because people go to hell. Pharaoh was simply on the bad side of that coin. God showed his power through this stubborn, obstinate man so that God's name would be declared in all the earth. And guess what? Pharaoh's name isn't declared in all the earth. We remember God this morning, and get this, nobody knows who Pharaoh was. There's speculation out there. Lots of commentaries have lots of different opinions. Most of them will probably land on Ramses II. I don't even know who Ramses is. I don't even care. A, where'd he go? There's a picture back there before. Uh, that guy? I, who's that? We don't know which Pharaoh it was. History doesn't know which Pharaoh Moses contended with. I don't know, but I do know Jehovah God. I know the one who beat him. God's name was declared in all the earth, not Pharaoh's. We don't get glory for what happens in our life. God will use us the way that is necessary for him to be glorified. We don't get any in this life. Our glory doesn't come until the next, only if. We spend our lives here glorifying him now. How did God show his power? By delivering his people from a foreign land, despite the hard heart 
of that foreign ruler. Okay? That's a key statement, so I don't want to lose you here. Please. God showed his power by delivering his people Israel from a foreign land. That would be Egypt. Despite the hard heart of that foreign leader who was Pharaoh. Now, about 800 years, little history for you. About 800 years later, those same people, God's people, the Israelites, were captive in Babylon. Not Egypt. This time they were captive in Babylon. Different land, still foreign. Different leader. And God did a similar thing. We read about it in different places in Scripture, particularly this morning in Isaiah chapter 45. I'll read it for you. Don't turn there. This is what the Lord says to Cyrus, King Cyrus, different leader. We're not talking about Pharaoh anymore. And we're not talking about Egypt anymore. Now we're talking about Babylon 800 years later. And now there's this new king, Cyrus by name. Isaiah 45, God speaks and says, this is what the Lord says to Cyrus, his anointed one. God's calling him his anointed one. Never said that of Pharaoh, I don't think. Whose right hand he will empower. And God says, and why have I called you for this work? Speaking directly to Cyrus, why did I call you by name, Cyrus, when you didn't even know me? Why did I do that? So all the world from east to west will know that there is no other God. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Hey, that's the same reason God raised up Pharaoh was to make himself known in all the earth. Now he's doing it 800 years later to a whole different guy, still a pagan leader of a foreign country, but God's doing it for the same reason, to make himself known from east to west. He says, I will raise up Cyrus to fulfill my righteous purpose and I will guide his actions. He will free my captive people. Just like Pharaoh did. But it's going to work itself out a lot differently. Because in Pharaoh, he hardened his heart and hardened his heart, and then God confirmed and hardened it for him so that he, in the end, though he let people, God's people go, gets no credit for it. Cyrus, on the other hand, gets loads of credit and commendation, recorded forever in Scripture. My anointed one, God calls him. Why? Because he cooperated. He cooperated. And what was the difference between him and Pharaoh? The difference between him and Pharaoh was the condition of the heart. Clearly, Pharaoh's heart was hard. But in Ezra chapter 1, verse 1, it says this, quote, In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, the Lord stirred the heart of Cyrus. Just so that you know, there's a big difference between when God stirs a heart and when God hardens a heart. <laughs> big difference. He stirred up his heart, his affections. He softened him. Cyrus no reason to let these Jews go from Babylon, but for some inexplicable, not inexplicable, we know what the reason was. It was God doing a work in his heart. He lets them all go. Go back to your land. Rebuild. It's okay with me. Crazy story if you've ever read it. But listen, in both cases, God raised a person up to make himself known in all the earth. And in both cases, he did it by working directly upon the heart of the ruler of that foreign land. In Pharaoh's case, he did it by hardening an already hard heart. In Cyrus's case, he changed the heart altogether. Moody says, quote, God's work to Pharaoh brought out a hardness of heart that was already present. End quote. See, the truth is, Pharaoh was hardening his heart before God even began. Now, Paul doesn't mention that in this passage, and I think the reason is, is because he wants us to see God's power and ability to do whatever he wants. Paul didn't say, oh, and, you know, God only hardened his heart because he, Pharaoh was doing it already, you know. Paul just goes, no, he hardened his heart because God does whatever he wants to. Why is Paul bringing it out like that? Does he want God to look bad? No. He wants God to look powerful. He wants to paint a picture of God that says God's in charge. More not. God has free will and can do what he pleases. But you know what he pleases? You know what he wants? You know what God wants? He wants to fulfill the promises that he makes to his people. 
Who would fault God for that? He makes wonderful promises and then will do whatever it takes to fulfill those promises and won't let anybody stand in his way from fulfilling those promises to the ones to whom he made that promise. And so he, in both cases, Cyrus and Pharaoh both, he promises to give his people freedom and then exercises his free will not to enslave his people, but to liberate his people. God uses his free will to liberate people, just so you know. God does whatever he pleases. You can take that in one of two ways. Well, he's just going to ruin my life. Yeah, either that or he might liberate you from a really terrible one. Depends on whether you love your life or not. Depends on whether or not your heart recognizes its need for rescue. Again, it's the old illustration of a man drowning in a public swimming pool. There's the lifeguard. There's another individual in the pool who isn't drowning. Which one do you think appreciates the advancements of that lifeguard upon their wet body? The one drowning or the one who's just having a fine time? It's the one drowning. Because if you're just swimming around in a pool and you don't feel like you're drowning and suddenly some goofy lifeguard comes up and wraps his arm around you, what are you going to do? How are you going to react? <laughs> the girls are like, well, it depends. No, <laughs> no, no, no. All the dudes are like, I'm popping him in the face. I mean, I'd... weird. Not, not if you're drowning. Not if you're drowning. Things change when you realize you're in, in desperation. You, then, then you reach out and you grab and you let that lifeguard be whoever that lifeguard is trained to be. You just, you quit fighting and you let them do their job. Boy, if, if we would only do that for the Lord, quit fighting him and just let him do his job. Let God be God. In verse 19, Paul goes on and says, you'll say to me, he anticipates objections, and he, rightly so. Uh, I don't know if you guys realize this, but the church has been fighting over Romans 9 for half a millennia now. So he was right in anticipating objections. You'll say to me then, why does he still find fault? Because who, who's, who's resisted his will? We're all just doing, for that matter, Judas did God's will then just as much as Peter, right? Jesus needed somebody to betray him, and, and Judas stepped into that role, and he did God's will. So how could Judas ever, how could God find fault with Judas for just doing what it was prophesied somebody had to do? Shouldn't Judas get a little credit for that? Mm -hmm. I've actually heard that argument before from people who aren't aware that this argument was anticipated. It's funny. People are funny. Verse 20, he says, But indeed, O man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, Why have you made me like this? Does the potter, does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? You know what's interesting is that Paul is actually quoting out of Isaiah chapter 45, the one I just read from that dealt with Cyrus and God's calling Cyrus out for his own purposes. Isaiah 45 verse 9 says, and see if this doesn't sound true, or sound, uh, ring a bell. Woe to those who quarrel with their maker, those who are nothing but potsherds among the potsherds on the ground. Does the clay say to the potter, what are you making? What are you doing? So here Paul pulls out of Isaiah 45 and slaps it right in the middle of his own text. Any Jewish reader would have recognized that. They were familiar, especially with the book of Isaiah. They would have gone, ah, he's talking, hey, this is that passage that deals with Cyrus. And so now suddenly in the Jewish mind, in the, in the mind of his, his readers in the first century, they're seeing this, this contrast between Pharaoh and Cyrus. And we can put the pieces together here, guys. God has the right to do whatever is necessary for him to fulfill the promises he's made to his people. Listen, he promised to save you. He promised to save you if you'll put your faith in Jesus Christ. Do you want people interfering with that? 
Do you want, inter- do you want people to get in the way of your salvation? Yes or no? Then don't you appreciate a God who would step in to that situation and deal with the person who's trying to interfere with your liberation, your salvation? That to me, that God would protect me in that way, makes me go, thank, thank God that, that he would deal with Pharaoh in a way that was good for the entire nation. Go ahead and count it unfair that God would deal with Pharaoh like he did, but in dealing with that one individual, he saved millions. Let God be God. The Apostle Paul is quoting from Isaiah 45, as I've said, that very chapter we just read from, that deals with God raising up Cyrus. And so now we have an example before us of how God dug his fist into the same lump of Gentile clay and from that same lump made Pharaoh and made Cyrus. Same lump of clay. One vessel for dishonor, one vessel for honor. And why is Paul bringing that up? I'll answer that question, but before I do, let me say this, if I may. When I read verses 19, 20, and 21, it seems to me that perhaps the Holy Spirit, through Paul, is actually a bit irritated. Who are you, O man? That was Holy Spirit-inspired. Who are you to reply against God? This is the Holy Spirit rising up, not in defense of man, like we do, but in defense of God, like we ought. Perhaps there's a bit of divine irritation here at how people can feel so entitled to make accusations against God and pry into areas that we ought not pry into concerning God's motives behind things. Why God decides like he decides. The extent of his authority. Maybe we should leave that alone and keep quiet. Is that any of our business? How much free will do I have? Do you need to have God all figured out? The church seems to feel the need to have God figured out. And I think the church should sometimes just stop it. If you're familiar with the debate that's been raging over the theological idea of where God's sovereignty begins and where man's free will ends, it's a bloodbath. Leave it alone. I don't know exactly how salvation works and which part is God's and which part is mine. All I know is you'd better not trifle with it. You better respond in faith to what you know is true based on what you've been told in Scripture. There's a lot of stuff that we shouldn't tamper with. Consider what Scripture says. Psalm 139, verse 6. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. You know who said that? David. There's some stuff that David didn't know. Oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible is it for us to understand his decisions and his ways. It's impossible for us to understand how God works or why he chooses what he does. That's Paul, Romans 11. How about Proverbs 25? It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. God gets glory out of you not knowing what he's up to and why he does stuff. Glorify God by not needing to have answers. Isaiah 40, verse 28 says, his understanding is beyond searching out. Job chapter 5, God does great and unsearchable things, wonders without number. And in Job 37, it says, the Almighty is beyond our reach. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, the Lord our God has secrets that no one knows. 
right? There will come a day for believers when we know God as we are known by God, but that hasn't happened yet. So you won't know everything about God until you're dead. Until then, let God be God. It's just saddening because there are souls that are going to hell by the millions while the church sits around and bickers over whether God predestined them to go to hell. That won't help anything. Arguing about it, writing books about it, having conferences about it, debating about it, getting into arguments at work about it. I don't know whether God predestines people to hell. I have a hunch that he doesn't. And yet, back and forth we go. And in verse 22 he says, what if? (laughs) I like how Paul handles this. He just goes, what if? Like hypothetically, what if God was who you don't want him to be? What if, just because he wanted to show his wrath and make his power known, what if? What are you going to do about it? What if God wants to throw people in hell? What if God wants to torture and abuse? What if God was like one of those false demon gods that just ruins you for pleasure? Demands that you sacrifice your babies so you can have a better life and will withhold from you pleasure until you kill your kid. God could have been that, I guess. I guess God could have been whoever he wanted to be. I guess God could do whatever he wants to do. Again, hate to use the term lucky, but I feel kind of lucky that God loves like he does. That God has mercy to give. That God is as compassionate as he is. But what if? It's a good question, isn't it? What if wanting to show his wrath and make his power known endured with much long-suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. It's a good question. And then he quotes a few verses here to back up his argument, and that's always a good practice, just so we know that Paul's not coming out of left field with something new. As he also says in Hosea, quote, I will call them my people who were not my people, that infers the Gentiles, and her beloved who was not beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. Thank God that the Lord himself extended salvation and inclusion to all the rest of the world and didn't keep it for Jews only. That's what this verse is indicating, and that's Paul's argument. Isaiah also, makes out, or also cries out concerning Israel, Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved, for he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, unless the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we would have become like Sodom, and we would have been made like Gomorrah. I want to draw your attention back to verse 24 as Paul builds on this argument. This is kind of a a bit of a crescendo here where he says, not the Jews only, but the Gentiles also. Now let me assure you of something here in our consideration of all that Paul has said and will say. The original debate, the first century debate, the contention within the church that the Apostle Paul was hoping to avoid... Like the real reason that he wrote this chapter was not not to confuse us into thinking that God arbitrarily picks some people for heaven and others for hell. That's not why chapter 9 is in your Bible. It was actually to prove that God from eternity past had decided to make salvation available to everyone, Gentiles included, whether the Jews liked it or not, And that no amount of unbelief or opposition from either side would stop God from saving those who place their faith in him. God wouldn't let the most powerful Gentile ruler in human history, one of them anyway, stop him from saving the Jews. 
He wouldn't let Pharaoh get in the way of his promise to save the Jews, nor will he let the Jews now stop God from extending the offer of salvation to the Gentiles. And oh, the Jews tried. God exercises his free will to save the maximum number of both Jews and Gentiles who will exercise their free will by trusting in him. So guys, that is how God demonstrates his sovereignty, if you've ever wondered. That's how God demonstrates his sovereignty in this life by making salvation available to more people than you would have thought, not less. God exercises his sovereignty to make salvation available to more people than had he not exercised his sovereignty at all. Why do I say that? Because within the church, there are these doctrines floating around concerning God's sovereignty that go a little too far and say that he is responsible for withholding salvation from those he's predestined to hell. That can't be true, guys. That's not the God I understand. That's not the God I teach. That's not the God I follow. That's not the God of the Bible. God exercises his sovereignty in a good and kind and merciful and compassionate way, and he does it by making salvation available to more people than it sometimes seems, not less. Paul finishes this chapter in verse 30, and he says, what should we say then? <laughs> Woo, after all this, you know. Hey, and I understand that, that uh, this is a bit thick. Mm, chapter 9 is, is uh, uh, heavy duty. Uh, deep theology, you know, and, and I'm, listen, I'm, I'm, when I touch on things like the debate within the church and, the, you know, for the last 500 years, I'm just putting my toe in the water of something that there have been seminars and conferences and books and volumes of books and, and all kinds of things. Uh, so I'm doing my best to keep this so that we can understand it and we can take something away from it and all the rest. Um, the conclusion here is fairly simple. And I think Paul sums it up well when, he's, when he says, what are we going to say about all this? What are we going to say about all this deep theology? What are we going to say about how, how God's got great authority, his, his sovereignty is, is over all his creation. He does whatever he wants. And, and what are we supposed to say about how God hardens hearts and, and he has wrath on people and if he wants to have mercy, he'll have mercy. What are we supposed to say about all this? He says, well, here's what we can say. Here, here, here's what we can conclude. That Gentiles, that, that'd be me and you, who didn't pursue righteousness, that people who aren't even looking for God, find him. <laughs> that those who weren't even looking, weren't pursuing righteousness, have actually attained to righteousness, the righteousness of faith. Like, what can we say about all this? What we can say about all this is God made it easier for us. God isn't making stuff harder for you by being who he is. By being who he is, he's made this so simple that if you miss it, hell is on you. There's no way that we can fault God. If anybody goes to hell, it is on them. God made this as easy as possible. Salvation is as easy as it could be. He didn't make it a thing of works, like you got to try real hard and do a bunch of stuff and you know, pay a lot of money and give a lot of time. He did it based on faith. Based on faith, what you believe about Christ, and nobody can take that away from you. They can lock you in a dungeon and you can still have faith. They can torture you. You can still have faith. There's nothing that anyone can... Back to the end of chapter 8. You remember the end of chapter 8? What, what can separate us from the love of God? What could detach me from him once I have faith in him? Nothing. Nothing. Oh, it's so simple. But Israel, in verse 31, complicated it. Some people complicate the issue. Don't need to, but they do. Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, haven't attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they didn't seek it by faith. And this all comes down to faith. Uh, but as it were, they pursued 
righteousness by the works of the law. And for they stumbled at that stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. And whoever believes on him, because we're talking about a person, will not be put to shame. That person is Jesus Christ. Do you believe in Jesus this morning? Do you believe in Jesus this morning? It's a, it's a big question. But it needs to be asked, why? Because it comes down to belief. It comes down to faith. Uh, being bad can't damn you any more than being good can save you. Right? Your destiny isn't determined by performance. Your destiny is determined by faith or the lack thereof. Simple as that. And let me add this. Neither is your, pre, is your destiny predetermined. Okay? By a God who tells us it's His will that none should perish, but then predestines some people, like Pharaoh, to perish anyway. No, 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 no. That's not how it works. What decides a person's fate, and this would include Pharaoh, is how you react to the truth when you're exposed to it. The fate of some of you is being determined right now. Fate is determined by how you react to the truth when you're exposed to it and how you respond to God's work in your life when he does it. The question isn't, what's God doing to a person's heart? The real question how is your heart reacting to what God is doing? It isn't what God does to a heart. It's how that heart reacts to the activity of God and the truth of God in their life. We can argue all day whether God is the one who chooses who gets saved and who doesn't? The answer is yes, God chooses who gets saved. God decides who gets saved. But he's already told us who he's decided would be saved. He said it was the one with a broken and contrite heart. He said he would save the humble. We already know who he chooses. We already know who God's predestined. Those with soft hearts, not hard ones. And it was his free will to decide that way, and it's your free will now to decide how your heart is going to respond to the truth of God. Are you Cyrus? Or are you Pharaoh? Does your heart soften under the truth of God? Or do you allow your heart, as Paul warned us in chapter 2, verse 4, despise the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long-suffering, not knowing that God's goodness is supposed to lead you to repentance? There are some things that God does in a person's life who does have a hard heart that hurts. that troubles, that upsets you. All that is is God attempting to crush your hard heart so that you will come to him in repentance and be saved. Do you despise it when God makes that attempt? Because if you do and allow yourself to continue on in that way, then you are hardening your heart like Pharaoh did. Pharaoh was destroyed. And so will anyone else who hardens their heart as he did. Cyrus, on the other hand, was met with the truth of God, and though he had no idea who this God was, he responded favorably. His heart was stirred, and he cooperated with the plan of God, very much unlike Pharaoh. And really, we all fall into one of two categories this morning. We are either Cyrus or we are Pharaoh. We either have a soft heart or we have a hard heart. We either embrace what God is doing and the truth that he brings, or we are despising it. Only you know right now, you and God, you're the only two who know.